Now in Isaiah 18, we pick right up where chapter 17 left off. It started out in chapter 17, verse 1, the burden of Damascus. And uh, we talked about briefly how in the beginning of chapter 17, how Damascus was taken away from being a city and destroyed and the famine that was coming. And, and uh, let me just back up a little bit just so that you can see where we're at in the, in the book. Just really quickly, I just want to show you that in chapters 13 and 14, we were talking about Babylon, okay? being destroyed after the 70 years captivity of Judah is going to be over, way in the future, okay? Then in 15 and 16, we talked about the burden of Moab. That's talking about Moab being destroyed at the hand of Babylon, okay? Just so that you understand that. And then in chapters 17 and 18, again, especially in 18, Babylon is the oppressor, and that's what we're going to see. And I, I'll be honest with you, when I first started studying and, and and going through chapter 18, I was having a lot of trouble understanding the chapter, understanding what it was talking about. And I went through it and went through it and went through it, and uh, literally hundreds of times. And then, uh, But I mean, by the time I got through it, I definitely understood what it was talking about, and I understood that Babylon is the oppressor here, and we're going to see that very clearly by the time we're done tonight. But look at verse number 3. The Bible reads, uh, we're going to skip a few verses at the beginning, but the Bible says in verse 3, All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, See ye when he lifteth up an ensign on the mountains, and when he bloweth the trumpet, hear ye. For so the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest, and I will consider my dwelling place like a clear heat upon herbs, and like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. Now, in the Bible and throughout the Bible, a trumpet is used for a few different things, but one of the things that it often represents is the preaching of God's word. Now, of course, the famous verse, turn, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians 14. And I'm going to talk about verse 3, then I'm going to talk about the chapter as a whole. Very short chapter, only seven verses, but turn to 1 Corinthians 14. While you're turning there, I'll read another verse from Isaiah, where the Bible reads, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Now, a trumpet is a rallying cry used throughout the Bible uh, to rally people together to defend themselves, or to rally an army to go out to battle. And so look at 1 Corinthians 14, 7, the Bible reads, And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp. He's saying there are some things that make sounds that are not alive, like a musical instrument, for example. He says, uh, you know, pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? So likewise ye, here's where he's going to tie it in with preaching, he says, so likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. You see that? So he's saying here that a trumpet is something that's used to rally soldiers to a battle. Now can you imagine if all the soldiers are assembled and they're all in their ranks and they're ready, but they're just waiting for that signal. And they're waiting for, you know, they're going to go, charge! Okay, can you imagine if they're all ready? And man, you get to hear a pin drop, and they're all just waiting, and just, just everybody's silent, they're waiting to hear that signal, and they just hear like, <laughs> you know, they don't know whether to charge, they don't know what that is. <laughs> That's what he's saying here. An uncertain sound coming out of the trumpet. A noise is coming out of the trumpet, but is it the noise that we're looking for? What does the noise mean? We don't know what it means. Now, if it was, you know, you know it's charge, or if it was something like, um, what's it, you know, you know what that is, or now these all become cell phone ringtones, so you probably don't really know what they mean, anymore. but they actually have meanings you know, to people who are used to hearing those and they understand what they mean. And so, uh, but the point is that God is saying here, if you're a preacher. And, and you stand up and you don't say things in a way that's clear where people can understand exactly what you're talking about. Nobody's going to go out to the battle. Nobody's going to know what to do. People aren't going to have clear marching orders from God about how they need to live their life, the fight that needs to be fought, what kind of work that they need to do, the soul winning that they need to do. They don't know what to do because they're listening to this uncertain sound of the trumpet. Now, when he said in Isaiah 18, turn if you would to 1 Samuel 9. And I'm going to explain this a little further. But in, in Isaiah 18, he said, All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye when he, and the he is referring to God, lifteth up an ensign on the mountains, and when he bloweth a trumpet, hear ye.
For so the Lord said unto me. So when God speaks, we ought to listen, is what he's saying in Isaiah 18. He's saying the world needs to listen to what God is saying. Now, God speaks through preaching. The Bible says God had the new times manifested his word through preaching. And so when a man of God stands behind the pulpit and preaches the word of God, we're hearing from God. Now, you're going to hear from me tonight also. Not everything I say is straight from God. Everything, guaranteed, 100%. Everything that comes out of my mouth straight from God. No. But when I'm speaking God's word, that is straight from God. Maybe it's coming from the Bible. And that's why you have to bring your Bible to church. So you can look down in your Bible while I'm preaching. And you can see whether what I'm saying is really the way it is in the Bible. I've heard pastors get up and purposely misquote verses to fit their agenda. I've heard it done. I've seen it done. And they, they very clearly added or took out a word to give it a slightly different meaning. They'll use a verse like, so, you know, that God hates people who sow discord among the brethren. And they add the word the to make it sound like, you know, if you're sowing discord among Christians. And that's not what it says and that's not what it means. And, but if you add that word the, you can make it say something a little bit different than what it, than what it really says. Or uh, you'll, you'll hear people say, whatsoever thy hand finds to do, do it with all thy might. Okay, that's not what it says. But pastors will uh, purposely sometimes misquote verses because they sound a little better, make for a little better preaching. And so you've got to bring your Bible and look down and see whether these things be so. See whether I'm really telling the truth. Check me out. And so uh, preaching is referred to as the trumpet of God, uh, sounding forth God's word to show my people, he said in Isaiah 58, 1, their transgressions and the house of Jacob, their sins. Sometimes the preacher has to expose sins. You know, he says, this is what the Bible says to do, and you're not doing it. Okay, and not personally, of course, but just in general. Now, let me, let me say this, and you're in 1 Samuel 9, I'm going to get to that in just a second, but let me say this. As a preacher, my goal is to be understood more than anything. More than to be an eloquent speaker, more than to sound good or for people to walk away and say that was a great sermon. My goal is that people walk away and say, I know exactly what he was talking about. I understood the sermon. I know exactly what he was trying to say. I've walked out of sermons before scratching my head and said, well, what was the what did he mean? I mean, what, what did he, I don't get it, you know. And look, I'm telling you, maybe sometimes I might seem like a little bit less intelligent. Because I break, break things down, but you know what, that's the way it ought to be, because it ought to be simple enough to where even a child can understand the preaching. And that's what I strive to do. I believe that being a teacher, and the Bible talks about being apt to teach, to me, whether we're talking about math, whether we're talking about science, whether we're talking about history, whether we're talking about uh, in business, on the job training, to me, someone who's apt to teach is someone who's able to take something complicated and make it simple. That's what teaching is. That's what I believe teaching, good teaching is. Taking something that's very complicated and breaking it down very simply so that someone can understand it. Now, my goal is so that not that people will under, be, under, be impressed by fancy words that I use. If you can't understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, there's no point to that. I'm speaking into the air. And if I get up and try to be purposely ambiguous because I don't want anybody to be able to pin me down about what I believe or I don't want to really take the hard line stand about the King James Bible, or about standards of, of living, or about right and wrong, right. or about any issue of the day, if I'm going to sit there and, and, and be ambiguous, God says, I'm talking in the thin air. I'm like one that's beating the air. I'm like a shadow box. I'm not really doing anything or accomplishing right. anything or fighting anything. And so, here's something that's bothered me sometimes. I remember, well, it didn't bother me, it bothered my dad, actually. When I was a kid, I remember my dad brought a visitor to church. And man, the pastor was preaching a great sermon. And the pastor, he preached against the sodomites. Okay, and that's what he called them. He called them sodomites. Now, who knows what a sodomite is? Put up your hand. Virtually everybody. And he preached against the sodomites. But, but let me ask you something. How many people do you think out there know what a sodomite is? Very few. I mean, very few. And I, I've asked people and said, do you know what a sodomite is? Sodomite? They had never even heard it. They don't know what it means. And your average Joe Blow off the street does not know what that word means. Sodomite. Here's another word. Uh, britches. Who knows what britches are? Put up your hand. But you know what? The average person out there doesn't really know what britches are, to be honest with you. And so I remember the pastor, he got up and he preached this really hard sermon and he was ripping on the sodomites and this and that. And his friend had no idea what the sermon was about and couldn't really figure it out because he's, what's a sodomite? And 
my dad said, I don't know why he, he uses a word that people don't understand, okay? And because if you think about it, people are going to walk in and they hear the word sodomite. I want people to understand what that is. Now, now you say, wait a minute, that's a Bible word. You're right, it is a Bible word. I think we should use that word. I'm not saying not to use it. Here's the answer. Look at me. Uh, let me... Let me read this for you in 1 Samuel 9, 9. Look down at your Bible. It says, Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Now, what do you think more people understand? A seer or a prophet? The word prophet is much more commonly understood. I mean, if we just took somebody off the street and asked them, what does the word prophet mean? They know what that means. They're familiar with that word. But how many people know the word a seer? Seeing eye dog, you know, is it a, is it a, is it some kind of a soothsayer or a palm reader? No, you know, and, and so God takes the time here to explain a word that had become archaic at the time. Do you see that? At the time, the word seer was not in use when First Samuel was being written, but God wanted to give us an accurate story here of what Saul actually said, which was, look at the end of verse eleven, is the seer here? Now, instead, the, what the modern Bibles want to do is they want to change God's word and say, well, these words are not being used very often, so let's just go ahead and change them. Now, look, we don't need to change God's word. Sorry. What God did here is he explained what the word meant, but then he still, after he explained it in verse 9, he used the original word in verse 11, seer. Because if he said, is the prophet here, that's not really what Saul said. And so God's being accurate here, telling us it's the seer here. And so... In Nehemiah 8, 8, it says this. You don't have to turn there, but... So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So my job as a preacher is to read the book of the law of God distinctly. Not to be sloppy or change it or uh, uh, update it a little bit, but to just read it clearly what it says and then give you the sense and help you to understand the meaning. Now, that's why whenever I preach against the sodomites, I'll still use the Bible word, sodomite, but then I'll say, this is what I'm talking about, queers. Yeah. Now that's a word, there's a word that people know. Yeah. You know, I'll use this word, fags. Everybody knows what that means, right? And right. see, I'm not going to speak, I don't know about you, I'm not going to get up here and talk into the air. I'm right. going to tell you, I'm going to bring it right down on the bottom shelf where everybody can understand what I'm Amen. saying. Good. And that's the right kind of preaching. And, 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 and look, pastors will do this. They'll preach against women wearing britches. Well, here's the thing. Any woman who wears britches probably doesn't even know what the word britches means. So they're not that way. And they're very smart to do that because then they're never going to offend women who wear pants. Because most women who are wearing pants aren't going to know what the word britches means because it's an archaic word. It's a Bible word. It's used five times in the Bible. But, but when they get up and say, women shouldn't wear britches, they're going to get a whole lot of amens from the people who know that and believe that and are convinced of that. They're going to say, amen, that's good. And they didn't offend anybody. But look, when I preach about it, I'm going to say, if women shouldn't wear britches, that means pants. Right. Women shouldn't wear pants, okay? And, and uh, somebody wrote me a, a, a really mean letter. I got more mean letters this week I've ever gotten. I was getting them in the mailbox. I was getting them in the email. I mean, just all different formats I was getting them today. Or not just today, this week. And, I got the, and this one email, some woman in Mesa who's just screaming mad because I preach against women wearing pants. And this is what she said. Pants weren't even invented until 1,200 years after Jesus. Now, I'm thinking to myself, I don't think pants were ever invented at all. I think as far as you go back to clothes, I mean, wow, I got an idea. Why don't, instead of just one big piece of cloth, what if we just put a separate piece of cloth on each leg? And man, thank God, 800 years ago, somebody finally, I mean, after 5,200 years of human history, I'm glad somebody finally came up with pants. <laughs> and he said, in the Bible days, everybody was wearing these dresses because, because uh, nobody had invented pants. And, and would you have been man enough to wear one? And the answer is, I guess I'm just not as manly as I thought because I'm not willing to put on a dress. Okay? And, and, and the thing is, my wife had a good point. She said, well, that's funny. They must have not had sleeves on their shirt either because they, they hadn't really come up with that idea yet. You know? So they just wore like a big tube, a tube top. Right? Like a tube top and, and a skirt because nobody, nobody thought of it. And man, when somebody finally thought of pants, it was a blessing. And, then, and she said, everybody wore unisex, uh, the same gender clothing. They didn't have gender-specific clothing. Then why did God write a command in the Bible that says that... Uh, 
If a man... The woman, I'm sorry. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do such are an abomination of the Lord thy God. Why did he put that in the Bible if everybody's wearing the same thing? Amen. Correct. You say, well, maybe he's talking about colors. Show me the Bible where the Bible mentions colors of clothing. Well, you know, maybe it's talking about style. Show me the Bible where it talks about these different stuff. No, but the Bible does talk about pants, bridge, in the form of britches and hosen. Hosen is a German word that made it into the King James Bible in uh, Daniel chapter 3. That they were wearing pants, hosen, britches. Okay, and, and, it, and it does talk about men wearing pants in the Bible. And so, that's the only thing. It, if you can come up to me after the service tonight, I'll put it this way. Because the Bible must have all the answers. If you can come up to me after the service tonight and show me a distinction between men and women clothed, men men's and women's clothing in the Bible, then I don't know, I'll, I'll buy you an ice cream cone or something. You know? <laughs> if you can show me somewhere in the Bible where he distinguishes between men's and women's clothing, where he says, like, well, you know, pink is for girls and, and blue is for boys. Or if he says, well, you know, socks are only for men. <laughs> I don't know. Sweaters are only for women. I don't know. What, but the Bible is talking about men wearing pants. And the Bible does talk about women wearing dresses and skirts. Okay? And so I don't I don't know what to tell you. I didn't design the symbol for the bathroom door. You say, well, are you mad are you mad at people that women that wear pants? I'm not mad at anybody. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. You can take it or leave it. Okay? And I'm not I'm not mad at anybody, but I'm just telling you that's what the Bible says. Okay? It says that men should not wear women's clothing. And that women should not wear men's clothing. And, and he's not talking about colors, because colors aren't mentioned in the Bible. What he's talking about is what he put in the Bible, which is men wearing britches. And, what, and, and, and so, look, did anybody not understand what I just said? Of course not. Everybody understands what I'm saying. That's the way I like to preach, just where everybody can understand. And you, you say, well, I don't agree with that. That's fine, but you, you know what I said, though. Amen. You know what I believe. Now, you may not agree with me, that's fine. But you know what I believe. And I hope it's that way with everything I preach. And that's part of the reason why I preach the way I preach. So if you're ever wondering why I preach the way I do, this part of it. I just want people to understand what I'm saying. I want to stand up by the pulpit and, and be understood what I believe. What's being said is always uh, intended to be clear. Now go back to Isaiah 18. Isaiah chapter 18, we'll begin in verse number 1. Isaiah chapter 18. The Bible says, Woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters, saying, Go ye swift messengers to a nation, scattered the people, to a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden down, whose land the rivers have spoiled. And then uh, we already saw verse 3, but look at verse 4, it says, For so the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest, and I will consider my dwelling place like a clear heat upon herbs, and like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. For for the harvest, when the bud is perfect and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he shall both cut off the sprigs with pruning hooks and take away and cut down the branches. They shall be left together in the fowls of the, more, of the mountains and to the beasts of the earth, and the fowls shall summer upon them, and all the beasts of the earth shall winter. What in the world? And that's what I said at the first, you know, a couple hundred times. Okay. <laughs> I said the same thing. What in the world is this talking about? Honestly. <laughs> And I was, I was, because it's so cryptic. And, and let me, let me show you what's cryptic about it. He says, uh, he says, woe, I'm sorry, look at verse number uh, two, halfway down. He says, from their beginning hitherto, I'm sorry, go east with messengers to a nation scattered and peeled. What nation is he talking about? He never says. Okay? And he says, to a people terrible from their beginning hitherto. Who's he talking about? Who are these people that are from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia in verse number one? And what is all this about cutting down this tree and the birds and the animals landing in it and everything? So I, I, I went through it and went through it and went through it. And I was just thinking and, 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 I, and then I just started reading just big chunks of the book of Isaiah. Just trying to get the context, you know, going back several chapters and reading through it again and again. And, and uh, I read most of the book of Isaiah uh, just studying for this and, and just went through it and through it and through it. And then I started to think of different parallels, and I thought to myself about birds lodging in a tree. I was thinking, oh, where does the Bible talk about that? And I remembered that Nebuchadnezzar, 
was that great tree where all the fowls of heaven and all the animals and the birds lodged in his branches in, in Daniel chapter 4. So I got to thinking about that and I was thinking, okay, we're talking about Babylon, we're talking about the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and then in the last verse I saw at the very end, he repeats that statement about a people scattered and peeled and, and uh, from a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. So I think he's probably talking about Israel as this nation. And so, because they're eventually going to get back to bringing a gift to God's altar in the house of God in time. So I was thinking to myself, what else can I do to figure this out? And, and this, you know, maybe this will help you just know how to study the Bible. Looking for parallels, looking for signs of what God's talking about. Well, I, I thought about these words, scattered and peeled. Say, that's kind of a strange terminology. What does he mean by it? I know what it means to be scattered. People that are scattered all over the world. I know what that means, but what does it mean to be peeled? So I went to my concordance and I looked up the word peel. And I was just trying to see if it's used anywhere else in the Bible. And here's what I found. Look at Ezekiel 29, 18. Look at Ezekiel 29, 18. Because I'm trying to figure out, just, I, I didn't want to get up tonight and, and, and preach this chapter the wrong way. Because it's so cryptic and it doesn't give a lot of details. And so I didn't want to get up and say, okay, here's what it means to just make something up. So I was trying to look everywhere to figure out. And I mean, I worked hard and, and, and I was getting nowhere for a while. But so I just started just dissecting every word of this chapter. Okay? And, and here's, I, I mean, I got to where I'm looking up the word peeled, trying to figure out what it means. But look, look at Ezekiel 29 18. Son of man. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now, isn't that interesting? Because that's exactly what we were talking about. The branches. And that's the exact man that we were talking about. So this was further confirming what I understood it was about. It says, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder was peeled. Yet had he no wages nor his army for Tyrus for the service that he had served against it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, will I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Which, by the way, is the subject of the next chapter. Nebuchadnezzar taking over Egypt uh, in chapters uh, 19 and 20. And so he said, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude and take her spoil and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor wherewith he served against it, because they wrought for me, saith the Lord God. So here again, uh, my belief was strengthened. Then, like I said, I went and tried to get the whole context. And so I backed way up in the book of Isaiah and started just rereading the book of Isaiah and, and going through the whole book, about half the book. And I noticed that if you stay the context and if you understand the progression of where God's going with this, he's talking about Babylon. In the chapter, if you put it in the context of, of where we are in the book. And so there's three things right there that are, that are pointing me. And, and God wrote the Bible to be understood. He's not trying to make it difficult. And so the tools are there to study and understand the Bible. It's just a lot of work. Now, here's what I could have done as a pastor. I could have just gone on the internet and got one of these commentaries online from one of these deadhead theologians that wasn't even a Baptist probably from several hundred years ago. And I could have just went to Isaiah 18, or I could have got out the Schofield Reference Bible, one of these, and just went to the, to the commentary. And I didn't do so, but I'll bet you if I go to the commentary after church tonight, it'll probably be wrong. And, and usually when I've gone to them, and just to look see what they say, they're wrong. Because you can't just blindly trust what some man says, that he's just going to happen to know the right answer in every chapter of the Bible. And what happens is, he can be wrong one time, he writes a book about it, and then it just gets perpetuated for hundreds of years as every preacher runs to the commentary for Isaiah 18 to figure out what it means. Hey, I'd rather let the Holy Spirit be my teacher. The Bible says, I need not that any man teach me. You don't need any man to teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and his truth and is no lie. And even as it had taught you, ye shall abide in him, the Bible says. You say, why do we come to church? Look, the pastor can teach you things that you didn't know. I can help you grow and, and, and uh, learn more. But there's nothing that I preach behind this pulpit that you could not learn on your own. Amen. That's the truth. I mean, there's nothing that you could only come here and listen to me that you couldn't get out of the Bible yourself. You say, why do I come to church? Because the Bible commands you to come to church. Yeah. That's why. Because you'll learn even more by coming to church. But see, I don't want to be your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm just, I'm just trying to give you dessert here. 
Okay? Because you should have already got breakfast, lunch, and dinner on your own with God in the Bible. You see, you don't, it's not enough to just eat three times a week. You should be every single day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, reading the Bible for yourself, being fed. And then when you come, when you come here, it's like going out to eat a couple times a week. Okay? And you know, you get things that you maybe wouldn't normally get at home. Yeah. Okay? And so, but there's nothing, let me repeat, there's nothing that I ever preach about in this pulpit. That's true, anyway. You know, I hope everything I preach is true. But there's nothing I preach about this pulpit that you couldn't find on your own in the Bible. It's true. And, and if, if, if only I know about it, well, do I have a different Bible or a different Holy Spirit? No. The same anointing teaches you of all things, the Bible says. And His truth and is no lie. And even as in the thoughts, you shall abide in Him. And so the Bible says that the Holy Spirit should be our teacher of the Bible. And the Spirit will, will search all things, yea, the deep things of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And you'll be able to learn the Bible best on your own with the Bible and the Holy Spirit in you. And that's how I learned the Bible, and that's where I came up with this sermon. I didn't go to any commentaries. I didn't go to some theologian's bookshelf. I went to God in prayer, and I went to the Bible and read and read and read and read and read and read and read. And read. Yeah, that's a lot of work. Yes, it's a lot of work. And it's the work that God's called me and you to, which is studying and learning the Bible and living by every word of God. Amen. And so it's important. That we don't just go to man for the answer. And you know, a lot of people might want to come to me for answers sometimes. And you know, I don't mind if you ask me a question, but you'd be much better off to just go straight to the Bible and get your answer from God. I, that's why I don't do these big counseling sessions. And I don't do, I, in fact, I don't even do little counseling sessions. I just don't do them. I mean, if somebody asks me a question, I'll answer it from the Bible. But, you know, I'm not going to sit there and, and, uh, and go into some in-depth, you know, counseling session with somebody. Because... Uh, People already know the answers. Because some people ask me questions in this church, I usually say, what do you think? And they usually just tell me the exact right answer, and I say, well, you're right. <laughs> Go do it. Seriously, that's what I say to people. Or, or if I do tell them the answer, I'll just say, you knew I was going to say that, huh? Like, yeah, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> but oftentimes, you know, the counseling is people, they don't want God's answer. Because they know where to find God's answer. It's on the bookshelf. Yep. It's at home. I mean, you can just pick it up and read it. But oftentimes they want the pastor to condone something that the Bible doesn't condone. Right? That's right. Like the Bible says that God hates putting away. God hates divorce. But they'll go to the pastor, what do I do? This is what my husband does. Yeah. He does this and this. What do I do? What do I do? Because they want him to put a stamp of approval on, on divorce or separation yeah, right, yeah. or things that the Bible condemns. The Bible says, let not the wife depart from her husband. Amen. Okay? It, unless there's you no, know, it just says, don't do it. It says, when thou vowest to vow to God, he says, pay that thou vowest, for God has no pleasure in fools. So if you make a vow before God, you pay it. Amen. And you know what? People in the Bible paid a pretty big price to pay the vows that they made out of their mouth. Remember Jephthah? Yeah. Oh yeah. He kept his vow at a very great price. Oh, you don't know what I'm going through. Well, you need to read Judges chapter 11 and read about a guy named Jephthah. And then you tell me whether it's okay to break your vow that you made before God. But you, you, if, you, if you're looking for a pastor that will justify divorce for you or justify legal separations and justify all this stuff or whatever kind of separation, not even uh, any kind of separation, I, I'm not even going to condone you sleeping on the couch. Okay? But hey, if you, if you want to go out and find a pastor that will tell you all this stuff, you won't have to go far. That's right. Just open the phone book to Independent mm -hmm. Fundamental Baptist, okay? Yeah, and you'll find right. one after another that'll give you all the reasons why it's okay. And then you'll get to me and I'll just say, no. All right? That's yeah. what I'm going to say. Because that's what God says. Yeah. But yeah. gee, you didn't need me to tell you that. It's funny how uh, I've known people all my life who I didn't tell that to. They just opened the Bible and started reading it and walked up and said, well, this is what the Bible says. And I said, yeah, that's funny. How, how did you figure that out? That's the same thing I figured out. Because that's what it says in Matthew 5 and Matthew 19 and Matthew 6, or I'm sorry, Luke 16. Luke 16, Matthew 5, Matthew 19, 1 Corinthians 7. It all says the same thing, Romans chapter 7. And, and so they figured out the same thing I did. Wow, isn't that amazing? No, it's called, we both have the same Holy Spirit and the same Bible, so we got the same thing. But if you want to find a pastor that will justify all the wrong things you want to do, and you know, you might even get me to slip up sometime and tell you that it's okay to do something that it's really not okay to do. But just because I say it's okay doesn't make it okay. 
Right. And you can find some pastor to justify about anything that you do in your life. But if God doesn't say it's okay, it's not okay. Right. Amen. And that's why the Holy Spirit's got to be your boss. Not Pastor Anderson or any pastor. Right. The Holy Spirit's got to be the boss. Now these are hard, you say these are hard sayings. That's what the disciples said. They said, man, I'm not even going to get married then. So that's what someone said. They said, it's good. They said, if the case be so with the man and his wife, it's amazing how they understood what Jesus said, isn't it? If the case be so with the man and his wife, it's good for a man not to be married. And he said, all men cannot receive this saying, but they to whom it is given. He said, I'm not talking to everybody. I'm only talking to people who care what I say. I'm only talking to people who have ears to hear what I say. He said, uh, all men can't receive this saying. But it's the truth. Yeah. And, and, you know, all men can't take this kind of preaching that I'm preaching right. tonight either. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but at least everybody, all men understand what I'm saying tonight. Yeah. Okay? And so that's the truth. Uh, turn, if you would, to... Are you, are you still in Ezekiel? Yeah. All right, great. Turn to chapter 31. Now, remember, we're, we're, we're trying to understand a little more what God's talking about in this in this kind of difficult chapter. And I, I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, the book of Isaiah can be a little tough to understand at times. And uh, that's why it's good to be here and learn a little bit about it. But it says in Ezekiel 31, 1, And it came to pass in the 11th year, it's Ezekiel chapter 31, In the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude. Whom art thou like in thy greatness? Behold, the Assyrian was a seeker. Now, what was the Assyrian? The great empire that was before the Babylonian Empire. Not as large or as worldwide as the Babylonian Empire, but another great king of a great empire is being referred to as a tree. It says, it was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud. Now stop. Do you see that word shadowing? A shadowing shroud? This great king, he's like a tree that shadows. Okay, keep your finger there. Look back to Isaiah 18. You see, this was, this was my next clue as to what God was saying. I mean, I, I started just looking up every word I could. I looked up the word shadowing. Okay? And I, and I found it in verse number one. Woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And here's what I discovered. Listen to me carefully. It's not talking about a nation beyond Ethiopia. Because if you think about it, what nation back then was beyond Ethiopia that had this kind of power and might? I mean, Ethiopia, study the Bible. Ethiopia is always kind of described as the far reaches of the civilized world. Did you know that Ethiopia used to be a very rich and powerful nation? But then God cursed it with drought. And to this day, uh, it's known as, it's almost a cliche that Ethiopians are starving to death. Why? Because God cursed it with the drought. The weather changed and it became a desolate wilderness. Now, you say, wait a minute. Says God, he's talking about the land shadowing with wings which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. We're talking about a kingdom that extends all the way to Ethiopia, is what God's describing here. And so the shadowing is, is referring again to the tree symbolism that's, that's used later on in the chapter, and that it's, that's used in Ezekiel 31. So back in Ezekiel 31. But I looked up that word shadowing, and it helped me to understand what he meant. He says, Woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the... the which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. He's saying that these people are coming from beyond Ethiopia. They're part of the great shadow of this great kingdom. Okay? Now, back in Ezekiel 31, it says, With a shadowing shroud and a high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs, the waters made him great. The deep set him up on high, with the rivers running round about his plants, and set out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore, his height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied, and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot for them. Now turn to Daniel 4. This is the last place we're going to turn. Daniel chapter 4. We're going to see the story of Nebuchadnezzar being the great tree that we were referring to that, that is really the first thing that helped me to understand this chapter. You see, all throughout the Bible, these gigantic kingdoms and worldwide kingdoms are always described as extending from Ethiopia all the way to the great river. You know, that's always... Look up the word Ethiopia in the Bible. You'll find that it's always used as a measurement. Uh, I mean, not always, but very often it's used as a me measurement of how far these kingdoms stretch. I believe the beginning of the book of Esther, he talks about uh, King Ahasuerus ruling over 127 provinces. And he said, all the way down to Ethiopia, and all the way this way and that way. 
And so, if you study the Bible, you, you can find the answers in the Bible without having to go to man. Look at Daniel chapter 4, and, and uh, I'll bring you up to speed here, because I don't want to read the entire chapter. But in Daniel chapter 4, we have Nebuchadnezzar. He's taken over the entire world, and he has a terrible dream. And he wakes up from this dream, and he's distraught, and so he calls all the magicians, and the soothsayers, and the sorcerers, and the, the palm readers, and all these prognosticators, and he brings them in, and he says, explain this dream. And none of them could explain the dream. So he brought in Daniel, last of all, and he said, Daniel, he said, I'm going to tell you what this dream is, and you're going to tell me what it means. And uh, this is where he begins to tell the dream to Daniel in Daniel 4, verse 10. It says, thus were the visions of my head and my bed. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it. There's that word again. And the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree, and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Now, now stop right there. In Isaiah 18, that's exactly what God described. He said, But for the harvest, in verse 5 of Isaiah 18, if you want to stay in Daniel 4, if you want to flip over, he says, But for the harvest, when the bud is perfect, and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he shall both cut off the sprigs with the pruning hooks, and take away and cut down the branches. They shall be left together under the fowls of the mountains and the beasts of the earth, and the fowls shall summer upon them, and all the beasts of the earth shall winter upon them. So, very similar wording, very similar description here of a tree being cut down and, and animals being affected. So, back to Daniel chapter 4. The Bible reads in verse 15, Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. This matter is the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whosoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of man. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, and of course Daniel's name is Belteshazzar in that particular language, they change his name to Belteshazzar. Declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto thee the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. Now does this guy sound like he's saved? He's talking? Okay, first of all, he, he's saying the gods. He's not even sure if there's one God or a lot of gods, right? It's Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, not only that, but do you remember in chapter 2, he had a dream, and he forgot the dream. So he wanted, remember he wanted the soothsayers and magicians to come in and tell him the dream and the interpretation. They couldn't do it, so he was going to kill them all. Daniel and his three friends prayed to God, got the interpretation of the dream, brought it to Nebuchadnezzar, and boy, he put a chain on his neck and made a proclamation and, and he made him the second in command and his, he also lifted up his three friends and made them important people in the kingdom. And yet a couple chapters later he's still talking about the gods and, and remember who did he go to first? Not Daniel. But even in this chapter he went to the magicians, the sorcerers, the prognosticators. Again, he, oh, you got the spirit of the gods in you. Well look, he says, uh, what, what verse was I on? Know. Verse number 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour. similar to the word astonished. So he's, for an hour he's, just, he's upset, he's a little bit troubled by what he's thinking as he, as he interprets the dream. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof the all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowl of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong. 
For thy greatness is grown and reaches unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven, and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even the band of iron and brass, and the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord the King. They, that they shall thrive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, giveth it to whomsoever he will. And whereas they command thee to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. All this came upon the king, Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, so a year later, he walked in the palace of the king of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? For the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. So we see here that Nebuchadnezzar was lifted up with pride. Now God, over and over again, many, many times, we've read a few of the verses tonight in Ezekiel, where God said that Nebuchadnezzar was my servant. He said, I've given them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. I've given the children of Judah into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. I've given the children of Edom. I've given the children of Moab into his hand. God is the one that gave Nebuchadnezzar the ability to take over these countries and to have this great kingdom. They had no chance to win. They could not win because the thing was from God that Nebuchadnezzar would take over the entire world. And yet Nebuchadnezzar was lifted up with pride. First of all, he was committing wicked sins. According to Daniel, he said, you need to quit these wicked sins that you're into. And he said, you need to, you need to be uh, good to the poor and not oppress the poor. You need to change your ways or God's going to judge you. God's going to destroy you. And he said, it'll be a lengthening of your tranquility if you can uh, break off some of these sins. And who knows, maybe he did, because it didn't happen for a year. Maybe for a year he, he might have lengthened his tranquility a little bit by doing what was right a little bit. Now, he still wasn't saved, but at least he, you know, if he cleaned up his life a little bit, he's not going to incur the wrath of God uh, for these sins that he's doing and, and abusing the poor and what have you. At least he could have a little bit of tranquility. But what happened? You know, a year later, he goes out and starts blowing off his mouth. Look what I've built with my own. Look what I've done. Look how powerful I am. And God was angry with what he said. And so God took away his heart from him and gave him a beast's heart, the Bible says. And so he began to be like a wild animal in a human being's body. Can you imagine? I mean, what if all of a sudden a human being, let's say Pastor Anderson, became lifted up with pride and, and uh, looked at what I've done. And, you know, and all of a sudden God took away my sanity from me and gave me the heart of a beast. And what happened to him? He began to run around on all fours. He began to go outside and eat grass like an ox. He was out, out in the yard. Can you imagine pulling up to church one day? And uh, we don't have, of course, we don't have grass because we live in, in, we have grass in our house, but out here we have the rocks, you know. But, uh, I don't know, chewing on the side of a palm tree or something? But, <laughs> trying to eat a cactus like a, like a javelina? But can you imagine pulling up and pretending that we had grass? Pulling up and seeing me out on the front lawn eating grass like an ox. Chewing grass. You say, there's a preacher who really chews the cut. You know, the that's right. So uh, I'm in the right church. And so I'm out there chewing and eating grass in the, in the front yard. And the Bible says that the nails of his, of his hands began to grow like eagle's claws, the Bible says. Have you ever seen somebody with really long hair? I saw a truck driver today. <laughs> I was at one of these truck stops, and the truck driver had, uh, I, I don't know, of all his nails, but he had some nails that were this long. You wouldn't even believe it. They were about an inch and a half long off the end of his finger. 
And uh, I guess he's a truck driver, so he doesn't do much work with his hands. He can, I guess he can still turn the steering wheel, so he's got these big, long fingernails. But, but I've seen people with really long fingernails that did begin to look like eagle's claws. I mean, they get brown, and they get long, and they get hard. And uh, here he is, he's got these claws on the ends of his hands. He's running around outside, the Bible says he was wet with the dew of heaven. He didn't even have enough sense to come in out of the rain or, or get any kind of a shelter. He's just outside, eating grass, soaking wet with the dew of heaven. And the Bible says that his hair began to grow and to become like eagle's feathers. Have you ever seen people who don't wash their hair at all? And it begins to become coarse and... and and if you're, if you're a felt of bird's feathers, very rough and coarse, that's the way their hair begins to be. You, you know, I think of the Jamaicans with the dreadlocks, right? And you know, those dreadlocks, many times, they don't wash them for a long, long time. Oh, I'm not saying all of them, but oftentimes, they, you know, they put beeswax in their hair to make it go into those dreadlocks, and they don't wash it for a really long time, so I can smell the fact that they haven't washed it for a really long time. And so, this is the way he looked. Long, shaggy, twisted, matted hair. He's running around like a wild man out in the woods. He's living with animals, it said. His dwelling was with the beasts of the field. So he's out in the woods just living with animals. And he's, he, he thinks he is an animal. Now it says, till seven times pass over thee. And so I don't know what that means. I mean, but many people have said seven years. See, people say, well, it could have been seven days, seven months. Well, after seven days, you're not going to have nails like ego claws. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, bird feather like hair after seven days. I don't even think you necessarily have that after seven months. I mean, it's possible after seven months, I, I suppose. I think it's more like seven years here, okay? For him to be in this messed up condition and in danger of losing his whole kingdom, I think it was probably seven years would make a lot more sense. So I'd be pretty confident to say he's talking about seven years here of, <clears throat> of being like an animal. Now, after these seven years, it's, it's interesting. <coughs> Look down at verse 34. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High God. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Now, here's a change in attitude here. He says, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. Because I, I don't think he knew what he was doing when he was acting like that. But when his understanding came back, I think he remembered everything he'd probably been doing for the last seven years. And he started to realize, I'm not as cool as I thought I was. I'm not as mighty as I thought I was. And he says, uh, in verse number 35, All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned. I took a shower, you know, I took a bath, I got cleaned up, I shaved and, and cut my hair off, and he cut my fingernails, and he's saying, My glory, my honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lord saw to me, and said, Hey, why are you bad? Why are you be the king again? And I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me, Say, I became even greater. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Now, I, I personally think that he got saved. I mean, after that kind of experience, and, and you know, part of the reason why people don't get saved is because they're not humble enough to get saved. Because salvation is the gift of God, not of works as any man's will. And it takes a certain amount of humility to be able to accept the gift that somebody else paid for. We want to earn it ourselves. I did it myself. I built it. But he said, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I didn't build anything. God did it. And he can give it to whoever he wants. And so he's, he's saying, I'm just going to praise and extol the God of heaven. The God. None of this stuff about the gods. No. He said, just the God. Okay. And he said, nobody can say to him, what doest thou? Or, or question him. And, I mean, he can just, this moment, take away your mind. And he can do it to anybody today. There are people today who are insane. And their mind is gone. You know, God can make somebody lose their mind like that. You know why you're able to think clearly right now? Because God allows you to think clearly right now. You know why you're breathing right now? 
Daniel, in the same book, said, in the God in whose hand thy breath is, O King Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, God right now is the one who's allowing you to breathe every breath. That's right. I mean, you couldn't live another two seconds unless God was keeping you alive right now. That's the truth. I mean, God's the one who's keeping us alive. And that, that's a comfort to know that our life is in God's hand. I mean, he knows, he knows what's happening with that. And, and whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And it's his, it's his decision. And so we see here, back to Isaiah 18, we'll quickly just finish up here, we're just got done, but see how when we begin to compare spiritual things with spiritual, we begin to compare scripture with scripture, the, the chapter begins to open up to us and we can understand what's going on here. We're talking about uh, the nation of Israel, we're talking about uh, they're the ones who were stripped and scattered and peeled and destroyed, but he says in uh, verse number 7, in that time shall the present, he's talking about a gift or an offering that uh, the children of Israel will bring to the house of God. You know, they bring the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices, and so forth. And that's what the Bible calls the gift. Remember Matthew chapter 5? If thou, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remember, since thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. He's talking about offering and sacrifice. Okay. So he says here, In that time shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts of the people. He's saying from, you know, the source is these people, the Israelites, who, uh, from a people, terrible, I'm sorry, brought unto the Lord of hosts of the people, scattered and healed, and from a people, terrible from their beginning hitherto. And they should meet it out, and trod under foot. That's what Babylon did to them. Whose land the rivers have spoiled, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. He's saying one day again, they're going to be brought back into their own land, and they're going to bring their gift to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. Now, when did that happen? Of course, 70 years after they went captive, 70 years after they were scattered and peeled, this is God said. And King Nebuchadnezzar died his son, evil Merodach, was reigning in Babylon after him. And then after that, his son, Belshazzar, was ruling reign. And then when Belshazzar was killed by the Medes and the Persians, Cyrus the, the, Cyrus the Persian and, and Darius the Mede, then they commanded the Medes and Persians that the Israelites could go back into their land. And they once again did bring an offering to Jerusalem, and they did rebuild the temple in the book of Ezra and rebuild the city in the book of Nehemiah. And so that's what that's referring to in the last verse there, the Mount Zion. Now, what, what is Zion referring to in the Bible? Zion is, a, is the place where where the temple was built. It's a, one of the mountains of Jerusalem. There's seven, I, I don't know exactly how many mountains actually that, are, that, that Jerusalem is, is sitting on, but there are many mountains and everything to read about in the Bible. And, and we'll be talking about Mount Moriah and and these different mountains, and it talks about Mount Zion. Now, Zion is not as much, it's not as much a literal place as a symbolic name, a symbolic place. Um, and if you would turn to Hebrews quickly, uh, Hebrews chapter number 12. Look at Hebrews chapter number 12. Because the Bible says right here, and you'll see this all throughout the book of Revelation, we're not going to turn there. If you look up Zion in, in the book of Revelation, you'll see what I mean also. But he says in, the verse 22, in verse 22 of Hebrews 12, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Now we're not talking about the literal city of Jerusalem. We're talking about the heavenly Jerusalem, also known as the new Jerusalem. Of course, Galatians...